Uh, this is Vulnerability Research circa 1851. I am Skylar Town. I'm a research scholar at the Ronan Institute. They're a nonprofit institution that provides support for independent academics. I'm also a barista at the Barnes & Noble Cafe in lovely South Burlington, Vermont, uh, making fancy coffee drinks for nice people. I think that locks are beautiful, and I am very easy to get a hold of. Lock.gd, I pronounce it LockGod, and at Shoebox on Twitter. Twitter's a great place to ask me a quick question about a lock or any of my research. All right, previously at RVASEC, I spoke about, um, I, I asked you why you lock your door. And in the process of doing that, I touched upon the great lock controversy of 1851. Today, we're going to tell that entire story. We're going to expand on that dramatically. What that means is that we're going to have a few slides in common, but the other 150-ish slides are all going to be new material. So, hands down, eyes up, do this. Okay, most of you have a lock on your door that's a pin tumbler lock. Uh, Linus Yale Jr. is generally recognized as the creator of the modern pin tumbler lock, but he couldn't have done it without his father, Linus Yale Sr., who really couldn't have done it without the work of some of his predecessors, such as Stansberry, who filed the first patent for a pin tumbler lock around 1805. But Stansberry was just cribbing notes from Vivant Denon, who was an archaeologist that went with Napoleon into France, and really he was just writing down notes that some Egyptian dude wrote on a wall 4,000 years ago. <laughs> so, Linus Yale Jr., really interesting guy though, uh, and he went into business with a man named Henry Robinson Town. They formed the Yale and Town Manufacturing Company. And that right there is my name. Turns out I'm related to the guy. Old cousin Henry Robinson Town. Um, he minced no words. We're going to quote him a little bit later on. And he turned out to be uh, an amazing driving force in the development of the pin tumbler lock. However, Yale and Town are going to come a lot later on. So let's step it all the way back to the Egyptians again real quick. So this is actually an advanced version of uh, the Egyptian lock, as it was known for a long time. Uh, if you were here last year, you'll remember that I am trying to put proof out there that it was actually the Mesopotamians that created this, not the Egyptians, but rolling on. For a lot, long while after that, everything was terrible. Um, Everything was terrible except for the Chinese who were doing amazing work, but I have no idea what they were doing because it's really hard to get English language information out of China that's super accurate about locks. Working on it. Um, and there were a bunch of people knocking off that Egyptian Mesopotamian design, and those were okay. But for the most part, locks were terrible. They were just warded locks. They were easy to impression, easy to open. If you knew how the lock worked, you could open it. Uh, you didn't need the right key or anything like that. And everybody knew this. Everybody knew that locks were terrible. That was a universal. They still needed them, still used them, but they were terrible. Okay. Enter the lever lock. So this is actually out at that table over there. This is about a 200-year-old lock, maybe like 150 years old, somewhere in there. Um, but what's interesting about it is that it marks a really important transitional moment from these terrible warded locks into what will end up being the basis for many, many, many different types of locks um, and a lot of modern security. So this is Barron's lever lock, B-A-R-R-O-N. Um, this is the best that Google image search could do to find me a picture of Robert Barron. Um, but it doesn't actually matter that we don't have his picture because what he was doing was actually probably invented by some French guy 20 years earlier. It doesn't really matter that we don't have his picture either because this guy named Bird actually brought it to its logical conclusion. But it doesn't matter that we don't have his picture either because all Bird was doing was working off uh, he may have self-discovered some of this, but Brahma predicted most of the advances in the lever lock in a letter that he wrote to Baron after seeing Baron's initial lever lock for the first time. The letter basically read, hey, nice lock. For losers, here's how you fix it. And he details a lot of things that we're about to cover here. Um, so if you look at a lever lock, this red part is our lever. This is the active part that's going to engage with the key. Now the blue part is the bolt, and the black part is just the housing. When the key is inserted into the lock, it lifts the lever up off of the dark blue post. The post is attached directly to the bolt. The key will actually drag on this back part of the bolt and drag that post in, dragging the bolt into the lock. 
lever will fall back down on the bolt, and there you have one of our first real active mechanisms inside of a lock, where something has to be lifted, moved, and really interacts with the key. So, this is what Baron did. Brahma said, well, that's pretty cool, but I can just lift that thing up as high as I want and slap it all over the place. There's, 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 it's single acting. As long as I lift it, almost at all, I can lift it as high as I want, and it'll still open up for me. So what if instead we encase it? And so now, if I lift this up and I try to lift too high, or if I'm using the wrong key in the lock, the key will stop dead because I can't lift it any higher, and I can't get a hold of that bolt, and I can't pull it back. But even if we do this, it's still pretty easy to pick, and it's really easy to impression now. When I say impression, I mean that if we take that key and we insert it into the lock, and we turn and it stops dead, the first thing that we should do is remove some material from that key and turn and try again. And if it stops dead again, we remove some more material until it's at the right height and it's sliding through. So, instead of just encasing it, why don't we draw this H shape? And so now, if we lift it too high, it'll actually get trapped. Okay, and we have to drag it through this, this more specific chamber now, and in and open. And once we've done this, once we've drawn our H pattern, what if we add another one? that has to be lifted to a different height, and now we have a stepped key with two different positions. And then we're off to the races, because we can keep adding more of these, and, and we're, we're at a point of real security. And this is all developed fairly rapidly. So Brahma predicts a lot of these things in his letter to Baron. So why didn't Brahma implement these and start selling them? Well, it's because he had a dramatically crazier lock in mind. This is the Brahma safety lock, and it's awesome. Uh, each of the cuts of the key here are cut down to different depths. This one is a little bit extra intimidating because it was meant to be used in a safe. He also made small home editions of the same thing with fewer tumblers. The different depths in the key interacted with a series of sliders in there, which we'll look at in a little more depth in just a moment. So Brahma, um, when he came to London initially, Brahma was an actual genius. He was an actual brilliant man. He contributed to the sciences of toilets. He contributed to the sciences of fire engines, of locks, of all sorts of things. He died from pneumonia that he caught while pulling up fully grown trees by their stumps with his pneumatic tree murderer, whatever he called it, <laughs> um, in the royal forest. And that was when he was an old man out there ripping trees up by the stump. The guy was a beast. He was amazing. His lock was too. His lock seemed like it was from the next century. When he got to London, there was a bold, active criminal underclass. Um, people were trying to solve this problem in a lot of ways. The social situation in London wasn't the best. Um, this is when gas lamps started actually going out so that the streets would be illuminated at night. Simple things like that were, were changing. They were trying to actively change their society. And locks started to become this hot button issue where people were looking and saying, well, we're starting to have incremental changes in this. Maybe, maybe this is an area of investment, something that we can start uh, working in. Brahma saw this as an opportunity. The toilet thing actually was the same deal. They had terrible toilets. He saw it as an opportunity, made an awesome one, made a lot of, that's how he made his fortune, toilets. Anyway. So, he invents the, uh, the safety lock. Uh, unfortunately, soon thereafter, it actually gets picked. Somebody figures out how to pick it with a pin. And this is a really important event that doesn't get talked about enough. It's usually glossed over. This may well have been the birth of what we now call the tentative method. Here they were able to pick it with a pin. These are the sliders inside of the lock. And if you began turning the lock, and then with the pin depressed the sliders, you could feel where that big gap would engage a metal bar around the outside of the lock. And if you could feel where that gap engaged the metal bar, and you could stick it in place with that pin, and then do it to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, eventually it would spin, and you even maybe were able to decode the lock as well. So, Brahma's firm invented a new type of slider that had a series of serrations, so now you weren't sure what you were feeling. It had dramatically obfuscated things, and the people that had figured out how to pick it were no longer able to pick it. A guy named Russell in his shop, also don't have a picture of, I uh, made that change. This guy's actually important enough that I should try to find a picture of him. I, I feel bad about that. Okay. But he felt 
So confident, Brahma, not Russell, in this new lock with the new design with Russell's levers in it that he put the Russell improved Brahma patent in the window of their store at Piccadilly. And it reads on it, the artist who can make an instrument that will pick or open this lock shall receive 200 guinea the moment it is produced. Applications and writing only. This is also a very important moment. Opening this up to be a real contest for people to come and try their hand at this. This stood unopened for a very long time, even though very serious people took very serious attempts against it. The British government were also holding contests, but in the other direction. Who can make an amazing lock? In 1818, they launched a contest saying, we don't just want a great lock, we want a lock where we will know if someone has attempted to pick it. Enter Jeremiah Chubb. So, Jeremiah Chubb said, detector lock, awesome. I have an idea for that. Rolls out the Chubb lock, not to be confused with Chubb rock, which was later in the 20th century. So the Chubb lock, if you overlift the levers, will trip a detector mechanism that will actually lock those levers into place, and now even the original user key will no longer function. So, Chubb is not the first guy to come up with a detector mechanism. This is something that people have been working on for a while. A guy named Rexpin, Respin, Respa, something like that, made one. But the problem is you had to destroy his lock after you detected that something had been picked. With Chubb, there was another key that could unset the detector mechanism that the user had. So you could pick the lock open, or you could attempt to pick the lock open. Overlift it, it fails, the user comes home, finds that their key no longer works in the lock, knows that they have been attacked, but then can still unset the detector mechanism and use their lock as normal. Government loved this, gave Chubb and crew a lot of money, and Chubb started selling locks like gangbusters, started making their fortunes. So, what was going on in this brief period of time? We had had thousands of years of stagnation in the development of locks and keys and security and all that sort of stuff. The French were doing some amazing things with just making beautifully intricate locks. But they were still warded locks, still easy to open. The Iranians were experimenting with screw locks, where you would actually have to screw a key into place. But those were also actually relatively easy to open. You just needed slightly different tools, and there was no real active security involved. But during this brief period of time, we have multiple very secure mechanisms being invented. So, again, a lot of people were getting involved in the lock business because of the unrest in London, because there were public cries to try to find sol real solutions to this problem, whether they be social, technological, whatever the case may be. Additionally, Henry, old, old cousin Henry uh, would go on to say, Few self-respecting professional inventors have felt their mission to be fulfilled until they have invented a lock of some kind. Apparently, there is a fascination in the subject which they cannot resist, however complete their ignorance of, past and of the past achievements and present development of the art. And so each incontinently proceeds to invent things which, while new to his untutored mind, are usually already well known, occasionally in successful use, but more frequently, long since consigned to the limbo of useless and discarded schemes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> everybody was trying to invent a lock. The number of disused lock patents that are just litter the patent offices of both the US and, uh, and England around this time are absurd. Uh, but because there were so many people looking at it, occasionally we had real solutions. Additionally, the Royal Society, outside of the patenting of things, of, of people trying to get patent locks, the Royal Society were offering grants to people who would invent a lock, but then disclose the nature of it to the public without getting a patent. So they would fund your research. They would pay for the lock that you had invented. They would give you a bounty for it only if you didn't get a patent and you instead made that available for the public good, for anybody to use. And there was actual change. It wasn't just the locks, absolutely not just the locks. Gas, people have written theses on the gas lanterns. You know, pe people have written theses on all of the active cultural change that was going on at this time. But the locks definitely played a role, and they were celebrated for it. And because of this, 
the British people started to believe in the idea of perfect security. Perfect. Perfect security. That the security arms race was over. So, 33 years would go by after Chubb's lock, before the Chubb was picked, before the Brahma was picked, before the British sense of self-esteem would be crushed under Charles Alfred Hobbs' boot heel. That's 73 years from the outset of the beginning of this surge of new technology. That's four generations of people who were exposed to the idea of perfect security. People lived and died believing that nobody would ever be able to pick a lock again. And this had us using locks differently. This had us consuming things differently. This had us living in more interesting ways. The idea of locking a door and walking away from it and trusting that that was going to protect whatever it was behind it is relatively new in human history. If you have something of great value that's highly portable and you want to use regularly, you probably just keep it locked in your house, right? People kept those sorts of things locked in banks. But with the advent of affordable, highly secure locks, they had chests now and they had secure cabinetry and real locks on their doors that they could trust and walk away from. There are arguments to be made for all sorts of amazing changes in human culture based on this 73-year period. All of that, though, is just the setup for what comes next. Alfred Charles Hobbes rolls into England at the Crystal Palace for the Great Exhibition of 1851. But before all that, let's step back to America. Over in America, we have James Sargent, we have, this is either Irwin or Ruswin or another great old lock guy who I feel terrible that I'm not getting his name right, sorry, and a bunch of other people that just look like oldie timey lock guys. I think they're actually minors. <laughs> but there are a lot of old lock guys. Um, what we care about for this talk, for this day, is Alfred Charles Hobbs and Linus Yale Jr. Uh, Linus Yale Jr., though, again, we'll get to him later. Alfred Charles Hobbs made quite a name for himself picking locks all over America. He was working with the Day and Newell Company to develop a lock with them. He contributed to design, Day and Newell all contributed to design. The way that he would get bank managers to purchase their lock was to say, all right, if I can open your vault, you have to buy my lock. And they would say, sure, go for it. And he would totally do it, and they would have to buy his lock. And he did this over and over and over again, made a great name for himself. Um, probably the most famous exhibition of his skill came at the Merchants Exchange in New York, not the Mercantile Exchange, but no images. Um, and again, I, I really want to hammer home the idea of perfect security here, because when the Merchants Exchange announced their contest, it wasn't, come on in and take a day and try to open up our lock. It was, we will give $500 to anyone who can open our vault given 30 days to do it. Hobbs rolled in, and did it in an hour. <laughs> he was changing the game. And he and people like him and these public competitions that were happening at places like the Merchants Exchange had created this whole culture where people would actually go in and bring in a lock of their own invention. And they would put a sum of money up and say, if you can open it, you get the money and the picker attacking it would also have to put money up, actually. The picker attacking it damaged the lock. The lock maker got the money, but the picker got to keep the lock so that he could study it and learn from it, and develop his own things. The makers and the breakers were the same people, you know? So, again, Day and Newell and uh, Hobbes were working on their own lock. It was called the paratoptic lock. Um, means uh, something about being hidden. Uh, as, as it says here, a very complicated lock. Um, it is a very complicated lock. Uh, they wanted to take it to England. They wanted to take it to the Great Exhibition. So they dressed Hobbs up in an England jersey and sent him on his way. But right before he left, there was a guy named Pettis, who 
who I am desperately trying to find a photo of so I can stop using Bree's photo. A um, guy named Pettis wrote a letter to Dan Newell and said, hey, nice lot, guys. But you get the joke. Um, it was bad. He solved problems for them. He disclosed to them how he was opening their lock. And they were like, oh, thanks, man. And they fixed their lock. And that's how it went. It was as simple as that back then for this moment in time. Imagine if Pettis hadn't stepped up and told them what he told them. Our American locks would have been picked and eventually the British would have reconquered us. That's what I'm suggesting. <laughs> so, thanks to Pettis. Now Linus Hill Jr. is also over there toiling in America, but we'll get to him later, okay. So back at the Crystal Palace, uh, the British weren't big fans of us, uh, especially when we first showed up. In the papers, uh, even their ingenuity, great as it is, becomes ridiculous when it attempts competition with Europe. Double pianos, a combination of a piano and a violin, a chair with a cigar case in its back, and other mongrel constructions belong to a people that would be centaurs and mermen if they could. And I said it last year, and I'll say it again, but I would be a centaur or merman in a heartbeat if I could. <laughs> Absolutely. And if that's what it means to be an American, I am proud. <clears throat> so, they mocked us uh, uh, widely. We really looked ridiculous over there. <clears throat> Most nations, when exhibiting at the Great Exhibition, the nation itself would spend some money into like decoration and organization and staffing the thing. Instead, America, we just sent over a bunch of people that wanted to exhibit. We didn't spend any money on them. If somebody wanted to sell a lock to the British or sell a reaping machine or whatever the case may be, rubber, bullets, guns, etc., they paid their own way, they got themselves the hell over there, and they set up a booth in the American section. So super slapdash, and early on, there weren't a lot of us there. We had an enormous amount of space, and there were like 10 guys sitting around being like, check out my double piano. <laughs> this chair has a cigar case in the back. Um, and we probably did look pretty ridiculous. But throughout the convention, throughout the exhibition, they were giving out awards, medals, for having the best of, um, you know, just myriad, myriad things, uh, paintings, daguerreotypes, sculpture, jewels, the best mining, uh, 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 agriculture, yachts, locks, of course. So, where we first started to make an impact was in the agricultural trials. We had a plow that everybody mocked because it was so light and so gentle and it could be taken by a single horse, I think. And everybody coming to look at it at the exhibition said, well, it's a fine looking blade, but it'll snap the minute it hits some British rock in our soil. And the guy said, ah, you just wait. Don't you worry about it. You wait. We'll, we'll see. So he goes up and his plow tills the land so beautifully that when he gets back to the exhibition, all the British farmers are buying his plows. The only complaint that they had, the only complaint that the judges had, so he didn't get the top award, was that it made the furrows a little too rough. To which the British farmers said to the judges, yeah, no, we want the furrows to be pretty rough for planting stuff. We don't want to have to re-break them as we're going along. This thing works great. So they bought a bunch of our plows, they bought a bunch of our guns, they bought a bunch of our rubber. Now the reaping machines, this is not one of the ones from the competition, but there were two American reaping machines and a bunch of British reaping machines and some other reaping machines. And the only good contest day initially for the reaping machines was way too early in the season. The wheat was still unripe, it was pouring rain, and nobody wanted to be there. And they said before the whole thing started, you know what, maybe we should just attempt to reschedule this, go back to the exhibition, go back to the Crystal Palace, we'll do this another day. But one of the Americans was like, no man, I'm here to reap. I'm going to take this beast out, see what it can do. And it immediately breaks down. <laughs> so everybody else is like, all right, let's pack it up. Don't worry about it, Amerabro, you'll be fine. You'll, you'll get another shot at this. But the other American is like, screw that American, he's an idiot. I want to reap. And he takes his reaping machine out, and he reaps everything. There's wheat flying all over the place, or like right where it's supposed to go, or however reaping works. I have no idea. But <laughs> it goes really well, you know? It goes awesome. Um, 
And everybody's amazed, and he gets the top honors, and nobody else even bothers trying because their machines will break otherwise. So when this happens, there's a slight change in the tone of the British press. There's an article that said, a nation with a continent in its pocket can afford to be laughed at. Just saying, you know, I know that we mocked them earlier, and they did real well with the agriculture, but they better know how. They have a continent in their pocket. They have to farm that whole stupid thing. They better be good at this. They can be laughed at. They're fine. They're, they're, they'll buck it up. But they still wanted to make sure they were keeping us in our place. Is America not content with being America? But does it also want to be Europe? We suggest they divine their place and stick to it, rather than try to be many nations in one. For as Europe cannot be America, America will find she cannot be Europe. Well, we were going to stick that in their crowd, don't you worry. <laughs> so, the agricultural contests we were doing great in. Uh, the British military decided to go ahead and buy our guns. Many other things. Samuel Morse was there showing off Morse code. This, this whole exhibition, over a year long, sort of became America's coming out party to the rest of the world as a nation of people who had a clue what they were doing, you know? Not the yokel little cousin that managed to break away from the empire anymore. And when the yacht race happened, it changed perception even more dramatically. Because agriculture, fine, we do have a continent in our pocket. Even an idiot can drag a blade through the soil and plant some stuff. And we better know how to, otherwise we would have starved to death a long time ago. Fine, our idiot little brother can do one thing. But when it came to yachts, it was both a symbol of society and a very serious symbol of engineering. There were a lot of people following the development of the American yacht, which was properly called the America, as it was being built before it came over to the exhibition to begin with. There were a lot of people following this in England. And when it arrived, the British said, okay, well, we've had this annual yacht race every year. It's coming up again during the exhibition. Let us, for the first time, turn it into an international. Any nation can participate. There were 51 British yachts and the America, and no one else. So it was a big deal. The Queen came out to see it because there was an international ship in the race now. And, uh, and early on, Unfortunately, our ship had a fouled anchor. Going along, we were in the back of the pack for the first few miles. I believe a 43-mile race. So we're in the back of the pack early on. And there are little clusters of ships following the race when they can, tacking along islands with people celebrating in different areas. There's a big party all over this area. Now, by the midpoint, we have now caught up with most of the ships, and we're sort of deep in the middle of the pack, and people are starting to say, oh, look at the America, holding her own, really starting to pick up a little ground. Good for her, good for her. Then, by the midway point, a little past the midway point, we are now in third, maybe fourth place, with a couple of yachts that have broken way out from the rest of the pack. People are saying, wow, the America is a fine ship, keeping up with our best. Good for her, this is looking like a race, awesome. And then, we won by seven miles. We won by seven miles in a 43-mile race. That's nuts. That's insane. We started with a fouled anchor. We screwed up, and we still stumbled over the line seven miles ahead of anyone else. In the paper the next day, they described an incident where the America, as she was coming into the finish line, slowed down lowered her colors, and everybody on the ship came out, bowed their heads to the Queen's barge. And they said the next day, the race wasn't even over. This was as if a jockey had stopped before the finish line to wave at the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but they loved it. The British loved it. They ate it up. There was a guy with a private militia that somebody apparently let near the Queen that just started having them firing off their guns in celebration. And so the queen herself, it is said, asked, who was first? America. And then she asked, who was second? No one. Yes. <laughs> the 
it's probably where we got that idea from, too. <sighs> so, Alfred Charles Hobbs only, I think maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks after this has happened. And we are being treated so much differently in the press now. Our praises are actually being sung. They're talking about our fast yacht. There are stories now about a steamship that made the fastest Atlantic crossing ever known to man to come to the exhibition from America. All sorts of other things. Goodyear was there with his India rubber globes, and who knows what those will become someday, you know? So Hobbes, after all of this triumph for America, and after us being taken more and more seriously in the press, rolls in on the convention floor, and people say, oh, we've heard about you. We've got a couple of locks. We've got a couple of locks. Why don't you see if you can pick them? So somebody sets up a trial against Chubb's lock. Um, Chubb's lock first. And everybody goes out, and Chubb has uh, opened himself up to competition as well before, though he didn't communicate with uh, Hobbs directly here. And several people invite him over to a Chubb new patent lock installed on a vault in a home in London. And they all stand around and watch this idiot play around with his tools. <coughs> <coughs> Within 25 minutes, the bolt was open. But this is the detector lock, you remember. This is the detector lock. And so they said, fine, you opened it. But if someone comes home to find their lock open, they're still going to know you picked it. Why don't you see if you can lock it, idiot? And he did in under 10 minutes. And then he's just playing with the stupid thing, you know? So Chubb is down. <laughs> and there are more trials against Chubb. They're actually juried by like, well-known members of the community that write reports about it and everything. Chubb will go on for another decade taking ads out in the newspaper saying none of it ever happened. But there are multiple clear accounts of it. Brahma, Brahma was a different story. Hobbes had to work hard to open the Brahma lock. Hobbes worked for 52 hours over 14 days with private, unsupervised access to the lock and all of his tools at his disposal. The padlock mounted firmly to a block of wood instead of flapping around. It was the, mo it was the best possible conditions for opening. But because of that belief in perfect security, they still let him go after it in exactly that way. He didn't really pick it. He basically brute forced it over about 52 hours. He built himself a spider-like looking key for it. And there's even, there's still debate today on forums as to whether or not he bent the disc or the, the sliders out of position or if he damaged the lock, blah, blah, blah. But the key worked in it after. That's all that mattered. And he did open it. He did open it in the end. Now, Brahma <coughs> was much classier about this. And unlike Chubb, and unlike Chubb, paid the bounty, fixed the lock, put it right back in that damn window. Brahma a hell of a company. So this was sort of the nail in the coffin of the British sense of self-esteem after all of the other things that America had won. It turned out we could be many nations in one. We could do just about anything. In the papers, a couple of days after the Brahma picking, we believed before the exhibition opened that we had the best locks in the world. And among us, Brahma and Chubb were considered quite as impregnable as Gibraltar. More so for the key of the Mediterranean was taken by us some years ago. It seems cruel at this time of day when men have been taught to look on their bunches of keys with something like security to scatter that feeling to the wind. It's heart-wrenching. Over in America, we were a little more excited. America still adds to her laurels in England in addition to making the fastest yachts, the best plows, the most serviceable reaping machines etc., etc., she can now out boast about doing the world and picking locks. It goes on to suggest that maybe being the best at picking locks isn't something that people would usually be excited about, yet, nationally, the prejudice does not seem to obtain. England seems to think just as much of us, and even a little more, though we have beaten her in everything and picked her locks besides. Ah. Oh. So, Hobbes stays over there. 
Hobbs stays over there and he keeps producing Day and Newell's pair of lock, now calling it the Hobbs lock. Uh -huh. Day and Newell kind of evaporate over here in America. He stays in England and makes his fortune. Brahma, as I said, handled it so classily. Brahma's locks were high security at their time. Brahma's locks are still super hard to pick. They are still sold in near original incarnation, brand new. They're expensive, they're amazing. The guy was like a wizard from the future. He was brilliant. When was the last time you ripped up a giant tree by its root with your hydraulic murder machine? <laughs> <clears throat> chub, I want to be very clear. I've been using the word chub to be interchangeable for several generations of a family. The original chub died without having seen his lock open. It was his sons that caused the fuss his sons that showed up to meetings and cried foul, his son that took ads out in newspapers and tried to ruin the Chubb family name. Some of those same articles that were begging, begging the British makers to go pick America's locks to prove that we were idiots too, also said, and Chubb, shut up. Go make a better lock that he can't pick. That's what you need to do now. We all know it got picked. Their own press turned against this guy because he was just mewling. That said, they got their act together. Chubb Lock still exists to this day as well. Chubb is now a member of another major group. Interestingly, in all of this, the Hobbs Lock, Day and Newell, etc., those are all rolled up. We don't have any of that anymore. But Chubb and Brahma persisted through this, improved what they were doing, and Brahma in particular is stronger for it to this day. So, awesome, right? As much as we rolled in there and kicked a bunch of British ass, and we did, great exhibitions are for exactly that reason, the world's fairs and so on and so forth. Yeah, you want to show off your industry and your capability and all the rest, but what you also want to do is gather the best technology, the best ideas, the most amazing art and thinking and philosophy to your nation. You want to take the best of everything in the world and build up your own people with it. And the British recognized this. And toward the end of all of this, there were people writing articles saying, America by herself has contributed more to our industry and our art than any other nation in the world. So Linus Yale Jr. finally. Just kidding, one more minute. Okay. So, <laughs> three important things about all of this, about this whole period of time. Number one, this challenge, uh, it was important. It was important that he not only created an amazing lock that changed the face of security, but that he challenged everyone to open it. This kicked off this idea, you know? Everybody was challenging each other now and sharing their ideas with one another. You could probe this lock, you could figure out how it worked. You could do whatever you wanted to it. You'd share your information with other people. You'd show up at the meetings of the Royal Society and talk all about the locks, you know? By putting this contest out there in a public way and inviting any member of the public to come and pick that lock, it was not just showing off how strong that lock was, but it was inviting the people of London, the people of England, the people of the English-speaking world to explore the security of the world around them. And it said, we're so good, we can invite you to do this. Our competitors should be so good that they can invite you to do this. You should be able to inspect this and still feel safe. And the Royal Society was out there throwing out grant money insisting you don't patent your lock. It's an early concept in uh, 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 open source, you know? People actually trying to support innovation without locking it down. And in fact, this goes a step further when we talk about Baron Grimthorpe, who sounds like a supervillain. Um, this guy's awesome. This guy's nuts. He also was probably a genius, but that sort that nobody likes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and there are people that say exactly that about him. They're like, you know, he's that sort of guy who acts like he knows more than you, and he does, and he's a dick. <laughs> but much more beautifully. You can tell when I'm not quoting the Victorians. Um, 
So Lord Grimthorpe, everything that he did, he refused to patent. He was a huge private proponent. Not, I mean, he would roll into the Royal Society occasionally, but he wasn't working with the society to, to blow all of his own personal money and time and, and intellect into projects that he would let everybody know about and give for the benefit of all mankind. He was antisocial as hell, but he genuinely wanted to do things for the benefit of all mankind, and he just didn't trust that any of you could actually do it, so he did it. A report on a lock that he invented, because as Cousin Henry says, everybody had to invent a lock. This lock has placed us under lasting obligations to Lord Grimthorpe for having given the invention to the world and not paid the government for the privilege of doing so, as every inventor has agreed to do now. This was just a straight spitting on the patent system. This also gave us the tentative method. So, I didn't label these three things well. Thing number one was the, uh, the contest, that public outreach. Thing number two was what the Royal Society and people like Denison were doing, taking it out of the patent realm and trying to do this as publicly and open as possible. And number three, we have the tentative method. The tentative method is that pin, you know, that pin going into the lock and turning, manipulating the individual tumblers. So now we will actually genuinely talk about Linus Yale Jr. Linus Yale Jr. made many contributions to the world of locks and security. He's a really interesting guy. But by the time that he died, he realized something else. He had an incident with the day and Newell lock, actually. He was playing around with the day and Newell lock in his workshop one day, and then, boom, got it open. And in that moment, as excited as maybe he was to open a competitor's lock, he also had the revelation that what he had done to this lock he could do to any lock he had ever created. And by extension, any lock that anyone would ever make that took a key. He, in that moment, understood that the tentative method can be applied with new tools that we develop for any of the locking systems that we've discussed and any of the locking systems that will come after for another hundred years. And so he turned his attention to safe locks. And there are already people working in this domain, but he made some serious contributions to this before he passed away. I hope, genuinely believing that he had gotten there. So Hobbes describes the tentative method in this revelation of Linus Yale Jr.'s thus. Whenever the parts of a lock which come in contact with the key are so affected by any of pressure applied to the bolt or to that portion of the lock by which the bolt is withdrawn as to indicate the point of resistance to the withdrawal of the bolt, such a lock can be picked. He's a very smart guy, but he wasn't a great teacher. As Yale Jr. puts it, any lock that takes a key can be picked. <laughs> and then, as Cousin Henry put it, any lock can be picked. In their business relationship, they became quick friends and seemed to be genuinely excited by each other's work. Linus Yale Jr. was an accomplished artist, actually, and wanted to just be a painter but got drawn into his father's mechanical world and turned out that he had an amazing mechanical mind for this stuff, and thus he began making locks. Henry Robinson Town, on the other hand, while a very clever man, was much smarter at the processes of business and manufacture, and those were where he made his major contributions to the world. The two of them, as I said, seemed to be very excited by each other's work. And sadly, three months into their business relationship, on Christmas Day, Linus Yale Jr. passed away. And Henry Robinson Town was left holding the reins of what would become one of the most important lock companies in America and eventually one of the most important lock companies in the world. So Town said, any lock can be picked. And he said it in the marketing literature. He said it in the pamphlets that would go out from what would become the Yale and Town Company. He told the world this. He also said that they made really good ones. But that any lock can be picked. And when I first found out about Henry Robinson Town's connection to myself and connection to the history of the manufacture of locks, I was still, it was still early days for me. This was still when I was picking uh, competitively and when just opening locks was the thing that was most exciting to me. My passions have changed dramatically. At the time when I realized this, I was initially disappointed because in my mind, this was the man that made the pin tumbler lock, the choice lock the world over. And all I did all day long was pick pin tumbler locks. How disappointing. 
But then when I started to actually understand him and understand what he was trying to do, and understand the fact that he was the last guy who was out there heading a major security company telling everyone, your lock can be picked. Here's how our locks work. When he was in charge, there were cutaways of the locks demonstrating their exact function. He was the last guy beating that drum. Sadly, after he died, things changed fairly dramatically. Yale, this trademark is one of the most important features to look for when purchasing a lock. It is unnecessary for one to know the detail of lock construction in order to purchase a secure and dependable lock, as this trademark Yale is acknowledged as a symbol of the utmost dependability in locks of every description. Nowhere in this pamphlet does it say anything about being able to be opened. It's perfect security, and you don't need to know how it works. Just know it's a Yale, and that's good enough. So after this period of innovation, what goes on? Um, Things got worse, right? So it's a simple chart, but as time goes on, the ignorance, if you look into public media on locks, lock picking, the controversy, all of those sorts of things, you'll see that more and more you lose the detailed description of how the locks work that are being attacked, how the attacks work, who are the people involved, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there was some of this at the time. Sometimes you'd see somebody say, oh, and we're terrified to tell you the instruments. But for the most part, people were talking about it. People were publishing about it. By 1900, it's like none of this has ever happened. So why does this go on? Uh, number one, public intolerance. Um, you know, four generations of people, four generations of people were taught to believe in the idea of perfect security. We changed the way we lived our lives. We changed what locks meant to us. We changed how we wanted to live with each other based on the idea of the perfect security of the lock on our door, on our chest, on whatever else we were protecting. Locks contributed to an actual change in society for the better. People could see that. And so when Hobbes rolled in and picked the British locks, the wall started tumbling down of that illusion. Now, a decade on, People are still, you know, interested. People are still picking. People are still making locks. People are still saying, this one's perfect. And somebody else says, ha ha, I broke it. And the media are still reporting on it. People are still kind of interested. This is from Punch Magazine, who were sort of like the onion of their day, only a lot bigger and a lot more poetry. As lock picking is now being cultivated as a science, we begin to fear that the police may hesitate to interfere when they see an individual engaged in an ingenious operation on a secret door. They go on to say, all of the big names are coming into town for the, for the great lock controversy, and they list a couple of actual lock makers, and then they list a couple of well-known criminals. And they're poking fun. They're joking that people are going to start doing this as a sport. And as it turns out, eventually we did. They, they weren't wrong in the end, you know? A decade later, they make a comparison saying, you know, we understand the need to pick a lock to determine its security, to understand it. We understand the need to break the lock. We also understand the need to slice bodies apart to understand anatomy. But we don't think either should be done in the streets. The tone changed dramatically. It wasn't a very funny article for what was usually a very funny paper. So another pressure that contributes to the first is the rise of the locksmith technician. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking at a couple of different conferences where Dan Gear was also speaking in the recent couple of weeks. Um, and at one of his talks, he said something about the transition moment when the hobbyists got so good at something that they had to go professional. And they had to build in these professional sort of standards and behaviors and attitudes to what had been a very open and exciting and, and you know, convivial process. I don't think he said convivial. <coughs> Pardon me. So locksmiths used to have to know blacksmithing, carpentry, they were bell hangers, they made locks, they, they made the physical components of locks, they were smiths of locks. 
locksmiths eventually got to the point where they were in such steady employ by the people who made locks and then by people who didn't want to go to the makers of their locks to get them fixed, fitted, repaired, removed, drilled out, opened, etc. There was a whole new class of locksmith technician who didn't know how to make a lock but sure knew how to break one and install a new one. And those guys understood that secret knowledge equaled money directly in their pocket. If everybody knew how to do the work that they were doing, that was not good for them. So they gilded up. The locksmithing guilds persist to this day. There is a guild in Texas of locksmiths that are powerful enough that guild laws are the laws of the state. You cannot go to Texas and be a practicing locksmith if you have not worked for a gilded locksmith for at least two years. You could have a multi-generational facility in Oklahoma and come over and start doing simple lockout work and you'll be breaking the law because the locksmith and guilds are that powerful. This is a <laughs> really interesting book. If you can find a copy on eBay, I suggest you check it out. Someday I'll digitize it. Half of the questions in this book are, my apprentice dared to open shop in the same state. How do I ruin him? <laughs> it's or my customer thinks I didn't do a good enough job and doesn't want to pay me my full fare, so I destroyed their lock. Am I going to be in trouble? It's a lot of like, what are the legal repercussions of horrible gilded bullying? And I want to take a moment to say that this is not what most of the locksmiths that I associate with are like, but. Um, it's a known problem as well. So, media interest as well. Um, a little while back, a guy named Narav Patel started 3D printing some keys. I know there's recently been some news about other people 3D printing keys. Narav was there a couple of years ago and he was doing it great. He's in IRC and somebody says, oh, you gotta show this to Schuyler Town. And he gets a hold of me. I happen to be in LA at the time. I happen to not have a place to stay and I happen to have been upgraded to a convertible for free at the rental car place. So I drove from LA to San Francisco where he lives. All along the way saying, hey, I'm gonna come to your house, I'm gonna bring you some cool locks and we're gonna print some stuff. And he was like, that's, that's fine, don't worry about it, this is fine, I shouldn't have gotten a hold of you. And then I'm like in the bay, two days later, I'm like, no seriously, I think I'm like 30 minutes from your house right now, can I just come over? And finally he's like, sure, God, oh goodness. And he was very nice, and he was really damn clever. It was really cool to watch him make these. So, these are 3D printed keys for the Abus Plus disk detainer lock, and in the course of making these, we discovered that the semi-hard materials of the 3D printed material allows us to almost fuzz the lock open. We can get close and the sidebar will fall into place. We can attack it with half cuts, you know? This launched a whole other year-long area of, of interested research for me attacking disk detainer locks across the board. And uh, this thing hit Gizmodo, it hit everywhere. Everybody was talking about these 3D printed keys. It blew up. No one cared at all about the higher security implications, about this new discovery in a possible attack space against the site security lock. Nobody cared at all, because they'd already seen 3D printed keys. Shut up, it's fine, don't worry about it. So back then, they were able to maintain the momentum for a lot longer, but it is, it's pushing a dead car to keep the media interested for an extra decade. For a decade after that, all the way through to 1900, when they couldn't care less and they start talking about people opening doors with skeleton keys again, which are a throwback to old warded locks, that long, terrible period. So, then, what does this mean? I gave a very similar version to this talk a couple of years ago at B-Sides Las Vegas. And when I got to the what does this mean thing, I drew a lot of comparisons to things that are happening now in information security. You still can. You guys know that sector better than I do. Draw your comparisons, draw your conclusions, use this. Throw my quotes at people. I love it, great. In the last four or five months, what I've come to realize is that what all of this actually meant was that we wound up on the other side with a better society. The uh, greed, ignorance, frustration, all sorts of dumb, awful things 
we ended up with a bunch of people who decided at the end of the day that even though the locks no longer work the way we've learned to live with each other, we're going to keep living with each other that same way anyway. We entered into this dark age of mechanical security, and that sucks because I love mechanical security. But in the midst of it and coming out the other side of it, we turned locks from a mechanical construct into a social construct. And the next time somebody says to you, oh, you know, where I grew up, we didn't even lock the doors. Not locking your door is not some metaphor for a tranquil life. An unlocked door is just an unused lock. If you really want to show a demonstration of a safe community and people that you trust, remove the lock from your door. Show everyone that you're not locking it. Demonstrate that visually, viscerally, physically. You won't. There aren't many people that do. At the close of the Great Lock controversy, there was a really interesting article that said, you know what? Now that we're beat, now that it's beat, now that it isn't perfect security, maybe this will be the transition moment into a post-lock society. And it didn't happen, but we got a lot of the same benefits. <laughs> and this slide I found, it was part of the original talk, and it doesn't have quite the same punch anymore, but this woman on Twitter thinks that if I want to tell people about locks and lock picking, uh, I must be a burglar. Burglars United, she says. Um, and I just recently found the tweet again after all these years, and, uh, and I'm very pleased to say that there are fewer and fewer of her out there. The modern lock sport movement and the modern security movement seem to be allowing people to start thinking about these things again for the first time since I've been in, um, and for the first time in a long time. More and more normal people get to think about these things and explore them just the way they were able to when Brahma put that lock in his door for the first time. You know, we lost it then. Let's try not to lose it now, okay? All right. So, thank you. Thank you, Jake. I'm sorry I didn't give this talk last year like you asked me to. <laughs> Many of the photos were at antiquelocks.com. It's an incredible resource, a wonderful computer uh, community. A lot of the other photos were just all over the internet, Google image, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can find me at Shoebox on Twitter, lock.gd, or Skylar Town on the internet. I think that I pretty much used up my time, so thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.